Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Foresight Intelligent Cooperation Group. We are finally moving on to cooperating with artificial intelligences and how humans can cooperate with artificial intelligences and also how they can cooperate amongst each other. So to bring you a little bit up to speed, we have in the first half of this year um, really uh, started from scratch uh, and um, in terms of what is cooperation, why is it important, what does it allow humans to do. And uh, then we moved on to further to discuss what can happen if we port the cooperative arrangements that we already have into um, the digital world and enhanced by crypto commerce. And now we are um, taking the next step and are asking what can happen if we uh, take the current arrangements that we already have and uh, include artificial intelligences into the mix. And uh, before we release the next chapters for the next few months, I think uh, it's good if we go back to chapter three, which is civilization as a super intelligence um, that is composed of human and AIs that are already cooperating um, to bring their specialized knowledge to bear on solving really large scale problems. So that's kind of what that chapter is claiming. Um, and in that chapter, we reference um, Friedrich Hayek, who sums up this dynamic by saying, civilization begins when the individual in the pursuit of his ends can make use of more knowledge than he has himself acquired. He, she, they have him, themselves acquired. Um, and so I think it's quite interesting because um, civilization's emergent phenomena don't really meet all of the criteria for an idealized portrayal of superintelligence. But nevertheless, I think that just as human, um, a human intelligence is really often judged by the ability to achieve a set of goals that set by an intelligence test. Um, there may be also other way, ways in which we can measure society's intelligence um, uh, by its ability to achieve a variety of goals um, that are set by individuals uh, using resources provided for this purpose. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the Gori papers, um, uh, the authors for the first time suggest such an intelligence experiment uh, a while, while back already. And they basically say, one can imagine putting a person or an ecosystem in a box and then presenting problems and contingent rewards through a window in the box. A, a box full of algae and fish will solve a certain set of neural set of problems such as converting lights into chemical energy, and will typically pay little attention to the reward. A box containing an intelligent person will solve a different broader range of problems, and a box, say, containing, say, an industrial civilization, which has access to algae, fish, and bell labs, will solve a vastly greater range of problems. And this ability to solve externally imposed problems can be taken as a measure of that ecosystem's intelligence. And so, you know, we are really trying to put forth such a more um, um, yeah, more holistic uh, and more uh, distributed uh, definition of intelligence uh, in which, um, you know, perhaps even corporations and uh, perhaps nation states and civilization um, uh, and civilization at large also uh, can, uh, can fit this definition. Um, and so basically, I think we don't really generally think of corporations or institutions or really any of those entities as intelligent, but nevertheless, their interaction in a framework of voluntary cooperation uh, of um, uh, its member intelligences, such as humans and AIs, uh, really allow us um, to more uh, effectively pursue our goals and solve a much broader range of problems. And um, so I think today, I'm really happy to have Richard Crape here because uh, he's here to discuss a new type of institution uh, that is particularly targeted at coordinating the intelligence of a diversity of humans and even AIs um, in solving uh, the problem uh, of of uh, of, uh, of financial stock predictions, and so um, this is one of the institutions I think that we'll see much more of, which are really trying to harvest the uh, local knowledge of its participant mem members, whether they be human or AIs, in a much more effective way uh, to solve large scale problems. And so, um, Richard, uh, please take it away. Present our new AI for as long as you'd like, and then we'll take questions. First, we'll start with on the record question, and then we'll move to an off the record. Um, discussion. Okay, well, Richard, please take it away. Thank you so much for joining me. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me try to share uh, just to show you what Numerai is. So, this is our website, but uh, let's just go into dark mode. Um, okay, so anyway, what is Numerai? We're basically the first hedge fund to give away all of our data. Uh, for free to anyone in the world who can then download it and build models on it uh, that they can use to uh, improve the, the accuracy of our signal and make us have a better hedge fund. Uh, so 
the problem setup is kind of unusual. So the first statement I said there, the fact that we're sharing all of our data um, is in some way uh, already a problem because if we were to share uh, the data in some kind of raw form, uh, anyone who built a model on it could effectively just run off with our data and start their own hedge fund. So we are already in a kind of position of tension with our users. We want them to have access to the data so they can help us improve the fund, but we don't want to give away the data so they can run off and start their own fund. Um, and so that's, a, that's the first kind of problem we had to solve. And uh, the way we solved that was by obfuscating the data we gave to our users. Uh, so when people are modeling our data, they don't know what they're modeling. They don't know what feature one means or feature nine means. Uh, it might mean the PE ratio of stocks, but uh, they have no idea. Uh, and then the, they don't know what the rows mean either. They, they don't know which stock is labeled which. So um, they're modeling, doing this supervised learning problem uh, on, on this simplified data set, which they can download here. Um, that's obfuscated and, and then they're submitting predictions to us. Uh, but that sort of gets us to the, the second problem, which is, so we we need a way to obfuscate the data to solve the first problem of being able to share the data. But we also need a mechanism of cap getting skin in the game uh, with our users as well. So if uh, you had a website like Numeri, where the goal was actually um, make really, really, really good back tests. So back test and quant finance is, you know, the performance of the strategy on historical data. And the big problem is that most people, anyone can make a very good back test, but it's very hard to know whether that back test is going to generalize into the future on live data. And many, many quant models that worked well before 2020. Uh, did very badly in 2020. And so that problem is very uh, severe in this setting. Um, in a normal machine learning setting where you're doing say face detection algorithm, if you have a thousand faces drawn from the same distribution as your training set, you will be able to predict uh, exactly the same level of accuracy on, this, on, this, on the test set. But in finance, the future is always changing. And, but there is still a sense in which the person modeling the data knows if they're overfitting. Uh, they can see their model has a lot of exposure to one feature and, and maybe that feature worked very well in the training set, but didn't work well on the, on the test set. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a lot that the person modeling knows about how strong their model is. And so how do we surface that information? So one thing that happened when we started Numeri, we basically were Sybil attacked. Uh, we had people sign up, make thousands of accounts and hope that one of them got lucky uh, and maybe did well on the test set, but wouldn't do well on the, on the live set. Maybe one of them would. Um, and so that problem uh, made the whole thing basically broken. The whole, the whole idea and company was kind of broken for the first few months until we developed staking. And so you can see on this uh, website here, uh, the users are uh, all staking uh, NMR against their model. So you can see this one user is staking 12,000 uh, NMR tokens. So it's like a cryptocurrency that we made which is $400,000 right now. Uh, so he, his model is staking a lot, uh, others staking, staking less. But the idea is if a person is willing to stake cryptocurrency on their models and we have the right to burn them if they do badly or give them more money if they do well, then they're only gonna submit the models that they, be, they really believe will generalize. And so by, by, by doing this staking mechanism, we've captured the coordination that's typically only possible inside of a firm. So inside of a hedge fund, often the employees of the hedge fund have money in the fund and you have to, you're kind of working there, you better put your money in the fund. 
Um, and so everyone's aligned to make the, the thing work. But when you're doing it in this more decentralized way like Numerai, we had to invent this staking idea so that people um, would, would be able to uh, still have the same kind of ability to express their confidence in the subsequent performance of their models. So that's a brief introduction. And uh, the result is, uh, you know, really we, we found the people who stake the most have the best models. And we found that when we make the stake weighted average of all of the models, that's the best possible model we can make. And so that's the model we use for trading stocks. Wow, this was very short and sweet. I love it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, let's experiment with having a few questions on the record and then we'll move to an off the record part later. Okay, then, you know, those that want to ask something that should not, should not be on the record can just wait it out a little bit and then we'll get there uh, in a few minutes. David, you're first. Sure, so uh, thank you. This, this is uh, really interesting. The, the, one of the problems that um, equity traders tend to have with uh, um, back testing, or uh, I guess other, other traders also, is that it doesn't tend to respond to um, market responses to trading. So I can say, I buy a billion shares, it doesn't change in price, it goes up a cent, and then I sell a billion shares. And look, I've made you know uh, ten million dollars, and everything's great. But in fact, you know, I, and, and that he also ignores uh, kind of um, the transaction costs and everything else. But um, how do you guys deal with that? Is that a is that a real problem that you face, or is that an immaterial compared to? Yeah, no, it is. I mean, the back tests are always uh, simulations, and that's why it's one of the reasons why often a good back test doesn't work in live is because of something that wasn't simulated well, such as the transaction costs or market impact costs. Um, what we do a lot to mitigate this, for example, like the stocks we we have in our universe are the most liquid stocks in the world. So they tend to be the kinds of stocks you can buy big positions in without moving the market much. Okay, I have, I have a super short question, which is um, how exactly gets decided um, how much gets burned? It's basically the same as, uh, yeah, it's like your correlation with the targets. So the targets are some kind of representation of subsequent risk adjusted returns. And so if you have a model that has correlation with subsequent risk adjusted returns, then you have something we can trade and make money on. So basically, if you make, if you have, if you're 1% correlated with the target, your stake will go up 1%. But if you're negative 1%, your stake will go down 1%. Okay, lovely. And I saw that, um, I think one of the co-founders of Algo, maybe I'm getting this wrong, uh, at least was in the video that I saw uh, on Numei. And um, so I would be super curious to know exactly how, how do you think, or maybe, you know, what, what, what have you learned? How, how does the new AI model compare to, let's say, general prediction markets in which, you know, people do that, but without the AI la layer on top, like what's, what's the actual benefit there? Yeah, well, it does the, basically mar any market is a, is a kind of money weighted average of, of, of what the thing should be worth. Um, so that is what we're trying to do with staking. Uh, effectively, you know, if a lot of people are staking that Apple is going to go up, we want to trust them because they have a lot to lose if, they, if it goes down. But the form of Numerai is all um, ML and data science and what's called cross-sectional global equity strategy, where you really, we're not looking for someone to tell us something like, uh, human based, like uh, Apple, I really love the iPhone, so I'm going to buy, so lots of people are going to buy iPhones and that's why I'm going to buy Apple, like something like that. Everything is very quantitative and uh, very cross-sectional. So you, so whenever someone's submitting a model to us, they're submitting it on thousands of things. But ultimately, yeah, we are finding the, finding information through the staking process. Uh, and through the models that people are building 
that that we don't think is is captured it well in the markets, which is why we can make money by adding that intelligence into the markets. And do you think there's any other use cases apart from uh, just financial data? Like this could be done on so many other areas, no? I kind of don't. Uh, I think finance is pretty good for this particular thing. Um, the, re the main reason is that the edge you can get in finance is very small. So if, if we had a model from that someone could take us from being 51% right to 52% right, that is a, a really big difference uh, in performance and for our whole business. But actually, I think if, uh, say, uh, detect, even though the stakes are maybe higher, but detecting cancer in an x-ray, um, if you can be 91% right by using your own model or 92% right by using a crowdsourced cancer detection model, you probably want to just use the 91% the model because it's, uh, it's just, almost, just almost as good. And the, the difference isn't as high. But, when it's market data, the, 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 the little edge we can get by, by doing the crowdsourcing really matters. Okay, but overall, you know, like, I think you're learning much more by having lots of people submit their models, right? So like, you're not only getting like 1% uh, necessarily, but like just by, by crowdsourcing a bunch of different models, you actually, aren't you like overall uh, as a system just getting more than 1% or? Well, um, yeah, we do feel, I mean, we definitely, if I say 1% right, it, yeah, I'm not really, it's hard to know what that means for our returns or anything like that. But ultimately, we, yeah, we are doing really well um, through this system. But I think, I think, whereas I'm not sure you should have crowdsourcing uh, for, for machine learning for everything, I am sure that staking is a really big deal for almost any company or organization. And the idea that, uh, I mean, imagine even just, if you want to like the bad actor case for Numerai was you'd come to Numerai and you'd submit a model you believed was bad. And then you would do it anyway because you didn't care because you had, you were Sybil attacking us. Um, now imagine any, any other system where you could have bad actors. So imagine you got burned, your stake got burned for tweeting something. Uh, maybe that's a weird world you don't want to live in either, but like the, the idea that you could like burn, burn actors, basically creating a negative incentive on the internet uh, does, make, does make for a very, very different outcome. And our website couldn't really work without this staking. And if you've heard of staking, uh, it's like a very, very nice property of blockchains and a lot of protocols are using staking. We actually started Numerai staking was almost four years ago now, I think July 2017. And ever since then, it's like kind of totally changed our business because we, we now have everyone with skin in the game. Very cool. Um, I don't know if you can comment on this at all, but um, I like another service that you're staking was Eraser Bay, which I looked up and would so really want it to exist. It, uh, it looked fantastic and it's very similar. You know, you can just ask a question, anyone can submit an answer. Um, you know, they stake something, you can burn it if you don't like the answer. And I thought this was a really wonderful uh, way of, um, of crowdsourcing knowledge and um, kind of related to. Um, a system that we discussed here in the group a while ago, Amex, the American Information Exchange, which was a really early um, uh, prototype uh, before really there was a, uh, the web browser that allowed folks to upload a request for information, then other um, folks could submit an answer. And, um, and then you had a different, uh, like an escrow type of arrangement where different, um, different amounts of money were released at different parts of the arrangement. So at first, you know, you would pay something uh, on, uh, on the opening of the contract, then uh, you pay something on the return of the document that answered your question. And then if you liked what they wrote, you could then pay out more. And so it's not necessarily like burning someone's stake, but it's a little bit similar and that there's like, you know, more of a, more of a tripartite structure. So do you think this could uh, be applicable to, yeah, more kinds of crowdsourcing knowledge or? 
Yeah, uh, Erasure Bay was a cool little app just to try to show this. Like we were trying to just show you could do, yeah, forget about the finance part, forget about the AI part of Numerai, just the staking part could be very interesting for our websites. The, the biggest problem was um, how much it costs to do transactions on Ethereum. Uh, so there was a person who fulfilled like a request I made, I don't know, I was asking him to like build a script for me that did something. And then he's like, okay, cool, I'll do that for you. And then he ended up spending more on gas than, than he ended up earning from the stake. So I think the all this stuff gets very interesting when you can do it at scale. And it's, I don't think it's, yeah, it's not like Facebook and Twitter or whatever, any consumer app has not thought about staking. It's just whenever they did think about it, they realized, well, this is going to be very expensive to do properly uh, and prohibitively so. Uh, so, but, so that's why Numerai, it's, it works because it's like financial data plus very quantitative people who understand how to make a blockchain transaction. So it's been like a very good first case of what I think will become a very big deal in the future. Yeah, you know, we sometimes do bounty brainstorm in our molecular machines group, for example. And I usually pay, not everyone sold in crypto, of course, but like those who do, um, I usually, uh, I, they can upload questions on a Google Doc. <laughs> And uh, then they have to write their email address, then I contact them, then they send me their crypto address or their PayPal address, and then I transfer them the money. And if if uh, if it's in ETH, then usually the gas is more than they get. But I just do it, you know, just just to keep the just to keep the ransom going. But yeah, it's definitely not there yet. But I think it would be a really, really powerful thing to have. Um, okay, wait, uh, Alan, you had a question. Yeah, I didn't quite understand the model. What if I buy a stake and I never submit a model? Do I benefit from other people's models? No, so you, that's a good question. A lot of people want to be able to stake on other people's models. But when you're, when you're staking, you are staking a submission. So you're, you're, you're uploading your model's predictions and then you're deciding, uh, should I, am I willing to stake on this or not? Uh, so you're always staking your predictions. Okay, because I see people have balances and if they don't submit a model on a given week, do they still benefit from the overall price change? Well, they, um, so you, you submit every week. That's how it works. Like everybody comes every oh, well, week. Let's say they don't, for, they don't for a year. So if, they, if you don't for a year and, and you've kept staking, um, you still have your stake, but it doesn't get burned or earned. It's just- Okay, it's that, just that's what I didn't understand. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I don't know if you are ready for a few more like further out uh, speculative questions on <laughs> what this could mean for the longer run. Um, you know, so I think like one thing that I thought was super exciting or interesting well, from looking at Numai is that it's kind of like an interesting mix between a decentralized and somewhat of a centralized service in the sense that on the one hand, it really democratizes financial data analysis uh, via this fleet of data scientists that kind of like collaborate in this uh, in this collaborative way like um, to um, yeah, to, to or compete really to get better. Um, and then on the other hand, you also have those like more meta models, right? Uh, machine learning types of analysis that at least sound quite decentralized. And at least from your video, I heard that uh, it's the um, you're trying to create like the one hedge fund that the world needs. You know, so I guess you know like using the kind of like a little bit um, you know more par parodic versions of labels of like decentralized and centralized. Where would you? Uh, see Numai AI there, or like what's kind of like an interesting schism that you're bridging there? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I mean, I, I think uh, maybe, you know, definitely we're distributed, right? So we definitely, that's one word you could use with us. Um, and then the, the cryptocurrency and the staking are happening on a decentralized blockchain that we are not in charge of, right? We can't we can't once when you stake we can't just like steal your money or something like it's on the blockchain it's in the contract um so there are a few things but i would say you know we are because global stocks are not tradable on the on blockchains that's the main central point right if we have a hedge fund it exists it has like a real bank account and real fund incorporation documents and things like that and and we're the ones with access to trade that capital. Uh, and 
and that's happening in the sort of centralized world of 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 stock market exchanges but if it reaches a point where uh all of the stocks are tradable directly on the blockchain uh, which there are some examples of this already um then we could potentially be kind of very untethered from the traditional financial system and be able, be able to be more decentralized uh and 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 maybe uh, in that future it starts to be very interesting more like numerai is like a dao and it's just run by these people who are staking and it's got like a life of its own and i often say you know numerai we're trying to we're trying to have we're trying to have no employees one day so we're trying to be like a bit like a bitcoin or something where it's like there are people working on it but they're not really working for the for a company they're just working on it for their own to following the incentives of the protocol super cool um and could you talk a little bit about um the meta model i think you called it in one of the videos like how does that work um and how does it yeah so the meta model what's there are very few uh, things in finance that are like laws uh that are true um but there's one thing that is absolutely true is that if you have two models and they're they're uncorrelated from each other you always want to trade both models you always want to because it'll lower your volatility uh and increase your returns um so the idea with numerai is what if we could be the one hedge fund that has more models than any other hedge fund and uh because and if we could do that we know from that law we would have a very high sharp high return strategy uh if it all if it all worked and uh and so the meta model is the ensemble the stake weighted average of every model on numerai and it is automatically improving right we don't have to do anything inside of the company for it to improve it's just as people burn bad models get burned off good models get earn earn more and rise to the top and the, and the as someone decides you know what i think my model is going to stop working they they pull their they pull their stake and we get that intelligence too right so all of those things are acting all the time and making the meta model stronger and stronger and stronger and uh it's you know i think we had something like 300 models a year ago and now it's like 4000 and uh there were only a few hundred thousand dollars at stake in total and now it's almost 20 million dollars at stake so it's very uh it's growing very quickly and it's it's almost like um you know like every time someone's submitting a model it's like someone's making a conjecture and then and then every time they get burned or earn it's like error correction and so it's like conjecture error correction conjecture error correction and it's just getting getting stronger and stronger every week Great. I think Lawrence has a question that directly um, relates to this. Lawrence, if you want to unmute. Yeah, if you want me to say it out loud. Um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, I was wondering if um, you're aware of uh, VeraDAO. Um, I recently joined uh, as a member and they, there is a token sale going on right now until until uh, Wednesday morning, US. And um, if you have any advice for uh, disrupting biomedical therapeutics development, not, not only drugs, right? Um, stepping sort of outside of the box of the way things are done right now in the field and, and you know, making research uh, more open and de democratized. So is that what this does, Vida Dow? Well, um, it's a step towards that. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, kind of um, funding longevity research, but this applies to more than more than that. Uh, my my question is a bit more broad, I guess. Um, yeah, well, I I don't. Um, it seems to me like there's a lot of similarities between we we're speaking earlier, Alison and I. But there's people who made money in crypto. There's something very. Uh, they they seem to be very very interested in also longevity. Um, yeah, the same I, people. 
Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think any, anything that, well, and it's unfortunate that this, anything that is happening on the blockchain is still regulated by the same uh, entities. Uh, so funding, funding something in the real world, which anything in like longevity would be, you know, doing trials on people or whatever, uh, is just going to have the same regulatory problems. Um, so I do hope that there's a world where um, that's maybe developing now where there's a sort of sense in which some politicians in some countries are becoming friendly with crypto people um, and, and basically saying, well, we're going to have laws that are very favorable to what you want to do. Um, and that kind of competition among countries hasn't happened before to this extent, I think, uh, but I think it will. I mean, even with the remote work phenomenon, suddenly countries are like, wow, if we make ourselves slightly better for tech workers or something, we're gonna get tons of immigration to this country. Um, but yeah, any, once you can do funding, if you can, if you're allowed to do funding on the blockchain, it's very easy, right? And that was the ICO boom and things. So there's so much that could be untapped, but I think a lot of the best entrepreneurs are still a bit afraid to try because their jurisdictions might not like it. Oh, it looks like you want to say something. Oh, well, I'm, I'm not afraid. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm thinking uh, this is the first thing that I've seen that it's like different, at least a little bit. I mean, Maybe it's not the most efficient way to organize people to work together. It's really like hard. <laughs> um, there's a lot of overhead, um, but you know, it's. I think it's worth doing the experiment, um, even if just you know one percent of the organizations would would be organized in, in in a decentralized way on the blockchain. I mean, I think ideally what you'd have, which uh, we discussed in the, I guess in the biotech group, um, is is that you'd also have a system in which people can share uh, in a privacy preserving way, the data that they already take from things like the Ura ring or something. And so then you didn't really have to rely on the normal uh, default infrastructure for doing trials, because if you have enough people sign up uh, and if there was a, a really good way of, you know, privately sharing that data uh, or of maybe, you know, using homomorphic encryption or something, uh, but then still have uh, deep learning, like aggregate data from that. Um, then you could maybe not, you wouldn't have to rely, let's say on the establishment and, and the way that they do trials, but you could maybe even crowdsource that. Um, and so that could be a, another way out. But yeah, with, with, with digital biomarkers, it's, it's easier. And there's a humanity um, app, which does, does uh, digital biomarkers. But um, first step, first real step would be to have an actual um, molecular, um, biomarker of aging that is accepted and then sure people could just i mean uh for example humanity is working with uh, illumina to have uh, dna methylation tests uh, under 50 dollars um that could just become mainstream a new um, wave of diagnostics for people to really prevent um problems and just kind of optimize their health but uh yeah if this becomes a trend then you know if we fund um, such a biomarker of aging and then people can just order it home we give I guess yeah I guess we can get some uh, GPs in every country to prescribe the <laughs> the interventions um, like metformin rapamycin so on and then see see what happens do trials in a demo, uh, decentralized way yeah and for anyone who's interested in that, we have a biotech group in which we discuss a lot of this. And the next meeting is tomorrow on uh, Steve Power's clock. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll box that discussion until then. But if anyone's interested, we definitely, I think people in that group really need folks who can build those technologies. So uh, please hop on over if you're interested. Um, I think that, I guess one thing that you had mentioned really, and uh, Richard, and how much those models get used and also for how much uh, capital they get used right now. I'm super interested in, um, if you could make any, let's say longer or like medium and longer term predictions on um, what could happen with that intelligence and let's say in like five to seven years, um, you know, do you expect any 
um, you know, any qualitatively different insights to arise from that in a way where, you know, if you, let's say you had like, you know, longitudinal data of, of this for like 10 years or something, you know, they must get better in a way where potentially you really unlock a different type of quality of intelligence or is that not something that you think is possible? Uh, no, I do think there it is. Uh, I think quantitative, uh, well, in the finance domain, like quantitative finance, uh, the, a lot of it's not very high tech. It's actually very like low tech. Uh, if you're a market maker or something and you, you see one stock is a dollar cheaper on another exchange than the exchange you're on, you just, you just buy it on that one that exchange and you sell the other exchange and you arbitrage and there's no mathematics uh, or modeling involved or intelligence really. And so finance, I think, was that for a long time. It was just kind of like, can you do the greater than or less than sign comparison? Uh, but now it's uh, with machine learning models in finance, it's starting to be, it's starting to be weird. It's like, why, why can this model make so much money when none of the risks of this model can be explained by any risk model? Uh, it must be, it must have learned something very uh, unusual. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. We're also trying to be very, very uncorrelated from any other hedge fund product out there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, one, I mean, one of the things I used to think about when I started the company in 2015, a lot of people were talking about AGI and uh, AGI risk and things. And I always felt that when you press people on AGI stuff, they'll be like, well, it, won't, it doesn't even need to be AGI. Eventually they'll just say, it doesn't even need to be AGI. It could just be narrow AI. There could just be one narrow AI that's very good at the stock market. And then even that would be very destabilizing to the world. Um, so I always, the, the reason I started Numerai was kind of like, well, maybe I'm not gonna be the one who finds out how to make that narrow AI that's really good at the stock market. But if I make a website that has open data set for anyone who does find that, then, um, then you know, at least I'll get to be friends with the person who, who uh, has this narrow AI to predict the stock market. But, but yeah, I do think it's very, it's a much richer um, space than, uh, than what's previously been done. And you really could, you could be in one quant fund or another quant fund and they'd go up and down at the same exact month. Um, and now with machine learning funds, it's like, these guys are really doing something different. And uh, that, that different intelligence hasn't, hasn't reached the markets to date. And it will be very, very interesting when it is fully developed. And I mean, in three years from now, um, Numerai could have billions of dollars staked, billions of dollars in our fund and be making, uh, making the market way better than it is to, today. And do you feel like, you know, on the long run, um, the main contributors of their intelligence will remain, uh, let's say, human entities? Because, you know, one could even imagine, you know, if there were really good automated bots, um, maybe there's a way in which you could uh, even like pay those bots in cryptocurrencies and, um, uh, you know, and incentivize to participate in the market really as, oh, not only, you know, you wouldn't only have models uh, that, you know, that use uh, human generated data, but you could maybe even have bots that participate and partake in this like intelligence coordination, or do you think that's also yeah. a bit of a... I like it. I mean, it's also very, um, it's like they, we pay people in cryptocurrency already. So it's, there's no reason why someone can't completely automate out the whole thing. Like, um, maybe some of the humans who designed some of the models on Numerai haven't even looked at the models for the last year. They're like on vacation. Um, and then they come back and they're like, yeah, this model was automatically retraining, automatically staking more when it was more confident and, uh, and just kind of like growing its, growing its wealth automatically. And we do encourage our users to set, set up these kinds of automated schemes. And a lot of the biggest stakers are fully automated. So it's, we never really know what they're doing, right? We never see their models. So we don't even know what, how their models are working or what they're, whether they're retraining every week or whether they're adding their own data sources. Um, so it's, it's a black box to us too. 
just like they can't see our data, we can't see their models, but we can both kind of trust each other using these, the fact that we have the same uh, aligned goals through the staking. Um, so this is, well, I don't know if this question makes a lot of sense, but like it's interesting because you use intelligence almost in the way that, um, you know, an informant would use intelligence. You know, they have this kind of like bit of like local knowledge or like, you know, this bit of almost like secret or private information that, you know, they have that others don't. And it's interesting that, you know, usually or, or in, in a different scenario, you use intelligence just as this, you know, problem solving ability. Um, and here you're, you know, really contributing that part of the intelligence in, in the sense of like local knowledge, you know, to that grounded problem solving ability. So I think it's like a really interesting way in which the two, I think, usually differently used uh, definitions of intelligence kind of merge or at least uh, collaborate or work together. Yeah, we do have this one uh, term we use on the website called metamodel contribution, which is basically whether your model, after we neutralize it, after we basically decorrelate it from the from the meta model, do you still have any alpha left? So are you a kind of um, subset of intelligence or do you have your own orthogonal component to the intelligence? And um, and that's really interesting too, because yeah, even on Numerai, it's like, it's not even really the best models that, that can make the most. It's, we pay them based on this meta model contribution. So it's, so they're basically very much encouraged to find some place they are locally good at and work on that uh and and that also is is like part of the error correction it's like there's always someone out there if there's a kind of hole if there's a hole in our knowledge as a fund that that hole is the most valuable hole to pull at any time yeah and this reminded me a lot of the i think i sent you the article that um ali yaya from anderson horowitz wrote on decentralized autonomous hive minds and uh, he was basically saying that maybe we can tackle this problem of, let's say, intelligence, whether you want to call it AGI or whatever, getting too centralized by instead um, uh, having um, different folks, by incentivizing a, a diversity of actors um, through uh, DAOs to bring together their local knowledge to, uh, to a problem. And so he was basically saying that what the more centralized services aren't really good at is, you know, really finding out like, the like long tail problem in AI, like really trying to, you know, do the nitty gritty. So there's always like this one little thing that could still be improved, but it's not really, you know, quite efficient. And, um, you know, he was basically saying, well, uh, decentralized autonomous hive, hive minds could really uh, parse out and, um, and incentivize folks to bring that local knowledge to the table that uh, maybe the big um, machine models don't really have access to. And so he was saying that almost as an AI safety strategy, I guess, you know, to some extent against uh, more decentralized, uh, more centralized uh, uh, AI services. So, I, and it's, it looks to me like, you know, Numa AI is doing something at, at least a, a little bit similarly in, um, you know, in, in, in incentivizing a number of different folks to bring their lo local knowledge to the table. So I thought it was a really interesting parallel at least. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree. I think, yeah, what people don't, um, I think a lot of people who are familiar with economics and markets, you can, you realize how, how good markets are at, uh, collecting intelligence basically. And you think, if you think of an, uh, maybe an example of an AGI, you were saying maybe civilization is kind of like an AGI or something like that, but you can have, um, markets also would be one of those things where you're like, wow, this really works like this is really putting capital into the right places uh, because there's no one who's not incentivized to help put capital in the right place so if you have markets like that and you have ai as well as like a kind of intelligence and you have staking ais i think this is like so clearly going to become uh, super in, super intelligent over time yeah and i think that's kind of a, a really big reason why we're writing the book is and to kind of you know, wake people up to the fact that civilization can already be regarded as a super intelligence and it is distributed and it is composed of a lot of different intelligent entities like you and I and a bunch of computing entities now too. And we're all cooperating, cooperating to bring our local knowledge to the table. And through that, we're increasing the problem solving ability of civilization. And it would be nice to continue this more, um, you know, I guess distributed uh, system rather than, you know, trying to uh, really 
replace it with uh, one super intelligent entity that then may or may not be aligned with our interests. So it's very much, you know, like a sub theme of the book uh, that we are slowly getting towards. But uh, Ravi had a question. Yeah, just a question of it sounds like if you're obfuscating the data, does that prevent people from doing like qualitative prediction, like understanding the news from NLP and then saying energy stocks are going to go down or retail stocks will go up or something like that? Yeah, um, so the data we give out, there are, there are many fundamental variables in that already, but you still can't do qualitative analysis on those variables because of the obfuscation. So although the data, it's, I wouldn't say, you know, almost any of the models are, are pure technical analysis, they're all looking at fundamental data, but, the, but yeah, it is, a, it is a bit harder for someone who, yeah, who's not, who doesn't have predictions on lots of stocks, like, you know, and has one or two specific market insights um, to benefit or use Numeri. Um, and the reason for that is just, yeah, we trade so many stocks, it is a quant fund. And if someone tells us, hey, we think Netflix is gonna go up, um, it doesn't really help us, even if they're right every time. Uh, it, it's like not quite what we're trying to do because everything we're doing is, is super like risk neutral and super uh, cross-sectional. So we're almost not trying to find stocks that are gonna go up, but portfolios that are gonna, gonna go up way more than their risk says they will. But in some sense that comes from the way you're doing the ensembling of the different models. Like you're just doing a simple, you know, stake weighted ensemble of the models. Whereas if you could do, you know, like an equivalent of an attention-based model, where you figure out which stocks in particular models are better at predicting, then you might you might be able to do that. Yeah. So there is um we do have a new thing called Numeri signals, and people on that are actually submitting on the raw stocks. So you could have you could have any you could model could be built in any way, uh, and any any yeah any way you like, but um, but Numeri normally is, is on the obfuscated data. But if you also have a model on any other data, you can now submit that. And that's becoming like a very important new part, new way to get completely new data into the system. Because we're always to some extent constrained by how good our data is uh, on Numeri. But uh, if we let people not only build whatever model they want, but also use any data set they want, then, then that could be uh, really good. But yeah, the state weighted meta model av average idea, uh, it is, we've tried to beat that. We really have. We've tried to uh, build the model on top of the models. And it always is, is a little bit less robust and a little bit, little bit worse than just trusting people's stake. And so by trusting their stake, you're trusting that, that they know the right weight to be. Yeah. <laughs> 